Hello everyone and welcome to Fanshawe College's virtual open house. My name is Andrea and I work in the reputation and brand management department of Fanshawe College and I will be your host for today's session. Um, before we begin today's session, I would like to review a few housekeeping items. Um, audience webcams and mics are turned off for this video, for the session, so don't worry, no one can see or hear you at all. If you have any questions throughout the session, it's super easy to, to submit them uh, by using the questions feature. To access the questions feature, just click on the speech bubble with the question mark and type away. Following the presentation, we will have a live Q&A from all the questions submitted, and we will try our best to get through all of your submitted questions within the session time. If you have remaining questions after the session, we recommend you email myfuture at fanshawc.ca or book an appointment with one of our Fanshawe College recruiters who will be more than happy to help you. Lastly, if you happen to have multiple programs open and running, it may compromise your webinar experience, so we recommend you take a moment now to close any programs before we begin. Today, we are joined by Alexandra Hawkins, Nicole Frey, and Megan Shannon, who will be speaking to us about the academic supports, assignments, research, and testing at Fanshawe College, and I will be back again for the live Q&A, and I'm going to pass it to uh, you guys. Thanks so much for um, being here. And hi, I'll Andy. Pass it on to you. Hello. Thank you. Um, hi, Nicole. <laughs> All um, right. So, um, like Andy said, uh, I'm Alex. I'm here with my colleagues Nicole and with Megan. So we're going to switch um, throughout the presentation as we um, cover different topics. But I'm going to start us off by um, discussing Innovation Village. So we thought it appropriate to start with um, our most exciting news. So if you've attended other sessions today, or maybe you've explored the um, college's website, you may have heard of Innovation Village. So basically, Innovation Village is a, a massive renovation that's happening right at the center of our main campus on Oxford Street in London. And so the library was fortunate enough that we were front and center to all of these changes. And over the past year, we've moved from our old space into a brand new, completely renovated part of the college. So coincidentally, this renovation actually put us in a really good position um, when we had to quickly adapt to the pandemic last March. So of course, a renovation is a fantastic opportunity to go through our collection and get rid of a lot of um, unused material. And we also moved a lot of our content online as well. So this meant that when we had to close suddenly because of COVID, um, students had easy and uninterrupted access to the majority of our library's content because we had already transitioned most of our resources into um, an online format. So libraries are quickly changing and we started noticing the same thing in our old space as well. So when people think of libraries, they often think of quiet, if not completely silent spaces with strict rules and so on. So that is not the future of libraries anymore. You can see in the photos below um, that the library is designed for innovation, of course, but also for collaboration. So those are the principles um, behind the, the new design. So in the left-hand picture, you can see uh, we have lots of, of tables and open study space for students. Uh, our new desk is right at the back of that, uh, that picture on the left-hand side. In the right-hand picture, you can see uh, the tables and the group study rooms. So these were very popular in our old space, so we made sure that these were a priority in our new building as well. So the group study rooms um, are available for collaborative work, and they also have TV hookups as well. So group members can hook their laptops up to the TVs on the wall for easier sharing. Um, not pictured is uh, the Indigenous Spirit Circle, which is the new focal point of the library. So that was collab or sorry, created in collaboration, I should say, with the Institute of Indigenous Learning. Um, it's just kind of behind the scenes and from the picture in the left, but it's it's beautiful new space. Um, like I said, it's the focal point of the library and we're we're kind of building uh, around that. 
So we've um, moved into a new space, yes, but we've also streamlined our services as well. So in our old space, we were staffing three different desks uh, in the library, which was confusing for students who weren't quite sure which desk to approach with which kind of question. So we've streamlined that into a one desk service model. So again, you can kind of see it in the back of that picture um, on the left hand side. So the idea being that it was easier for students um, to approach us, it's easier for, um, for questions and for referrals. It's all happening in, in one space. In the same vein, we've also been fortunate enough to have the Learning Center and the Test Center on campus amalgamate with us into the new official Library Learning Commons. So with library staff and Learning Center staff under one roof, and the Test Center is not far off, We've streamlined our services even further so that students can access professionals to help them through the entire life cycle of their paper from the research um, to the writing to the citation all the way through. All of those services are now under one roof. So we'll have a little bit more information later on um, about what those specific services actually look like. So like all businesses, we have seen various forms of openings and closings over the past year. So as of right now, London is currently in the orange zone of the Ontario COVID framework. So that means we are open for students, but with some restrictions in place for safety purposes. So the anticipation right now is to continue um, this same service model all the way through the summer and then reevaluate as we get closer to September and have more information. So currently, the library is open from Monday to Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eventually, with a full reopening, the plan is to make the library space uh, open 24-7 for students. So even after staff go home um, and leave the service points, Students will still be able to get into the new library learning commons, um, you know, for those late night projects and for, um, you know, that group study work at, at any, any time of the day. As of right now, while we are still under some limitations, students are welcome to come into the new space and they can browse our physical book collection by tapping into the book room. So you can see in that photo there, that's our brand new um, book room that holds our physical collection. Again, the idea is eventually it would be available 24 seven to students. They would just tap in with their fan card after hours. And there is a self checkout machine in that room so that they can check um, books out to themselves even if staff are not available. Um, alternatively, we are also offering a curbside pickup service. We understand that some students may not be comfortable coming to campus um, or, or staying for a long period of time. So students are able to place holds on physical books using our online catalog, and then we will pull them off the shelves and they will be available for students to pick up within 24 hours. So they would receive an email saying that their, um, their hold is ready for pickup. Um, again, as of right now, um, you saw those photos of the group study spaces. They are currently limited to individual study spaces right now. So we are open for studying. Um, but we just ask that students um, remain in the rooms individually, again, just for safety reasons. Um, we are monitoring foot traffic. We are asking um, students to use a sign-in process for contact tracing, again, just to be safe. These spaces can be booked on the library website or they can be booked um, just by coming to the front desk in the library as well. And then lastly, you'll see there, um, our colleagues on the math team are offering in-person services right now. So if you have math and science questions, um, they are available in the new space for help uh, by appointment. Very rough plans right now is to continue blending in-person services with virtual services um, into the fall. The feedback from students on the virtual services has been um, surprisingly positive. I, we know it's not everybody's favorite way to learn, um, but there are advantages to, to virtual services. They can be more efficient um, and, and more accessible. So our hope is to be able to continue offering those services as well as um, offering in-person services um, in greater detail in the fall semester. So even with a potential return to classes in fall 2021, students will continue to access the majority of our resources using the library website. So still using our online resources. 
So originally that shift from physical resources to online content was to um, facilitate and serve our students at other campuses. So uh, maybe your program operates out of London South Campus, London Downtown Campus, Woodstock, St. Thomas, and so on. So we started that shift um, with the idea that it's not fair to ask students at other campuses to bus or drive or travel from their satellite campuses to, to the main campus and to the library. So by putting more content online, it was more accessible for all of our Fanshawe students, regardless of where they were. And then as I mentioned, when the renovation was announced, um, we took that opportunity to weed our physical collection and transition more of them to a digital format so that our new space had more accommodations for um, student gatherings and for group study opportunities. And then of course, with the pandemic, when online resources suddenly became our only way of serving students, um, you know, they, they came in very handy when we had students studying uh, all across the world. So the library currently subscribes to 130 databases approximately. And all students can access all databases 24 seven. So all students need is their Fanshawe username and password to log into all of our digital resources. So eventually when you are assigned um, your Fanshawe login, it will be the same for your web advisor, same for your Fanshawe online, same for the library, um, all for consistency. So within those 130 databases, we have um, ebook databases, which are growing rapidly. Um, we have databases for academic journals. Those are probably the most popular and most accessed um, resources that we have. We have statistics and data as well. And then even a number of streaming video databases, which can be really cool. We have um, two in particular that are almost like Netflix databases. So um, with your uh, username and password, you can access the latest blockbuster movies, um, really interesting documentaries and so on, all for free um, with your, your Fanshawe login. The scholarly databases, on the other hand, do cover a wide variety of subjects and disciplines to ensure that all students um, you know, have access to the research they need to complete their assignments and complete their programs. Unfortunately, we don't provide um, free textbooks. We, we don't purchase textbooks in the library. Um, the goal of the library collections is to provide supplemental um, research for assignments. Okay, so we understand that, you know, for a lot of students, the library itself, um, just the space and knowing, you know, which desk to approach and so on, that can be intimidating. Um, but also expecting students to know how to navigate 130 different databases, um, that can be quite overwhelming for students. So. That's where the outreach team comes in. So that's myself and that's my colleague, Nicole, who you'll hear from shortly. So we are available for one-on-one -on -one customized research appointments and citation help. So students can book appointments with us um, using the library website, and we are available for each student for up to an hour a day. We're currently offering appointments um, via phone and via Zoom right now. But we can help students, uh, again, through the whole research process. So we can help them define their, um, their keywords, define their topics. We can talk about which databases are most relevant to uh, their program or to their topic. We can talk about evaluating public resources for quality and reliability. Um, you'll see academic integrity and citation also comes up in that list as well and, uh, and more. So again, like I said before, we've been really fortunate that our role transition, transitioned really nicely into um, virtual and remote services. So um, again, students have provided a lot of positive feedback about the Zoom appointments. So we hope to continue offering both. So hopefully we'll be able to do remote and in-person services um, when we do return so that we're accommodating um, all different needs. Okay, so the appointments are, are good for um, in-depth help. Um, and you know, sometimes students make that connection with a friendly face and they like to go back for that repeated service. But sometimes you know, we're not available, we may be booked up, we don't have appointments on weekends. Um, so where do students go for help at that point in time? And that's where the service called Ask On comes in. So um, if students have a quick question, Ask On is perfect um, for that kind of research help. So um, you can see the button there um, on the right-hand side at the top, you can see the Ask On button. 
So that button is posted on the library homepage and it's also embedded right into the databases. So if a student is searching in the databases and is you know, maybe a bit stuck, a pop-up will appear and ask um, if they need help. So they can go through that way, or again, they can go on the library homepage, click that button and that chat box um, underneath will, will pop up for them. And that's where they can enter their um, research question. And by doing that, it will connect you with a Fanshawe library staff member instantly. And so that staff member can help you um, with research questions so they can walk you through your search, they can provide some suggestions, they can assist with citation um, and so on. So ASCON is a joint service that Fanshawe participates in along with 11 other colleges in Ontario. So we are currently in the midst of a pilot project right now. So we are offering extended hours to accommodate our international students who are studying from home in other time zones. So right now um, on weekdays, we are open from 6 a.m. to midnight. We are available through the chat service, I should say. And then the chat service is also open um, Saturday and Sunday from 11 to 5 p.m. That might be subject to change um, you know, if we return to a more in-person model. But regardless, um, ASCON is always, always available. Um, again, with maybe a little bit of different hours, it's a little bit early to say right now. But sometimes, um, you know, it's even myself and Nicole on the back end, we all take turns staffing that service. So um, you might even be able to reach us uh, that way. So that's a very quick overview of the traditional library and more of the research side of, of our services. So more information can be found on the uh, library website or you're welcome to email me or, or Nicole um, if you have further questions about what the library and the research side can offer. So our emails will be posted at the end of the, the presentation um, and it's also available on the library website as well. So with that, I'm going to pass you over to Nicole and she's gonna go into greater detail about what the Learning Center staff um, can offer for students and their assignment needs. Okay, thank you, Alex. So the services um, that Alex talked about are geared towards using the library resources and conducting research, but we also have several colleagues in the Library Learning Commons that can help you with a variety of skills um, to help you be successful in your studies. And we're gonna look at those a little bit more now. So we have a colleague, um, Cheryl Mills is her name, and she's excellent at helping students um, learn a variety of skills that will help you with studying and learning and time management. So you can also book one-on-one -on -one appointments with Cheryl for up to an hour where you can learn about active learning skills. She can help you with learning strategies for reading textbooks and getting the most from that, a note-taking, test-taking, um, she spends a lot of time with students developing strategies for time management and organization. So organizing your notes and your schedules, um, preparing for exams and so on. Um, content comprehension and retention. So that's really important to learn strategies to really retain the information that you learn and, and from your notes and really any other studying or testing skill that you may be experiencing and you would like um, improvement, you can book an appointment with Cheryl and she can go over that with you. And she really customizes it to you um, based on your own individual needs. So that's um, very helpful. Um, we also have a colleague who's available for help with um, any English um, issues. So there are a variety of options available for students who would like additional help with English. Um, there are conversation circles where there are small group discussions with three to four students on various topics. So that's excellent for building fluency and vocabulary and, and confidence um, with English. There are reading and writing workshops that are task-based exercises to improve skills in reading and writing. They're very popular. Um, and as well with Jerry, you can book one-on-one -on -one appointments um, you can have 30 minute sessions on topics selected by students about um, essay writing, grammar, reading comprehension, pronunciation, et cetera. And the same with Jerry, um, as all of us that you can book one-on-one -on -one appointments with, it'll be customized to your individual needs. So you're getting the most um, from the appointment. So he'll look at it specifically the areas that need improvement and then, and then target those. So in addition to um, Jerry, 
we have an amazing colleague that can help with English writing help. You can also book individual appointments um, with Samantha from the website where you can focus on improving your writing abilities. That's so important for writing your assignments um, and she can help you with in improving grammar, punctuation, um, essay structure, flow, logic, citations. I know she's very helpful for students with structuring um, essays and paraphrasing as well. So she's really excellent and she can give you feedback for your assignments and then each time you'll see when you use the feedback, then you'll see how you improve from time to time. Um, so she's really helping um, students not proofreading or editing, but really correcting their, their errors to help you become better writers, that you can take those skills on then through the rest of your studies and then into your professional life as well. We have a whole team of colleagues that provide math and science help, and they cover all different topics, if it's general math, chemistry, biology, um, physics, pre-calculus, accounting, economics, Excel specifically. So it's really um, a huge selection. And there is uh, drop-in help or virtually. So you can drop in with quick questions or you can make an appointment as well virtually. And there is um, a math problem every week. And when you solve it, there's a chance to win a prize. So that's a fun way to, to um, participate in something and also, and also um, win something. So I encourage you if you're in a program um, where you cover any of these subjects to reach out to the math and science um, team because they're excellent and they'll be able to definitely answer any questions you have. Um, the Library Learning Commons also offers peer tutoring, which is one-on-one -on -one assistance from other students who have completed your course or similar courses. Uh, peer tutoring is available virtually and in person and you can also work as a peer tutor for other students once you've completed, um, completed those courses in good standing and you can get paid as well. So it's a really great option to get that one-on-one -on -one assistance from fellow classmates and or have the option to help your other classmates. So it's, it's a really a win-win situation, um, peer tutoring. Um, in addition uh, to um, the other academic support at the college, we have a test center. So the test center um, is important because it provides accommodated testing for students who are registered with accessibility services. So when a student requires um, accommodations and they get in touch with the accessibility services, then they could use the support of the test center. Uh, it's helpful if they're also missed or there need to be rescheduled evaluations and um, external client assessments. So that's when the test center would be helpful for you. Um, like us in the Library Learning Commons, the um, test center has just been newly renovated um, and it's, it's really great with different options for students depending on what your needs are at that time. So there are 17 private rooms um, that would be useful for a missed um, evaluation. There are um, computerized testing options as well as paper-based testing options. So there, there are several options depending um, what, on your individual needs. And when you um, arrive at the college and you have any questions about them, we encourage you to, um, to visit the website and get in contact with our colleagues from um, the test center. Um, the Library Learning Commons has created a comprehensive series of workshops for students looking to enhance their research um, and, and assignment writing skills. The workshops are hosted several times throughout the semester to give students um, flexibility in choosing the best session to, to, for your schedule and your timetable. Each workshop is about an hour long and they explore various topics to help you improve your um, skills um, and build confidence in that, in that area. So we cover everything from research foundations, um, database searching, academic integrity, APA citation. We also have um, digital literacy. There are subject specific ones for nursing and business. So when you're using the nursing resources and the business resources, it's really great to attend those workshops to get very specific um, information about those disciplines and the resources that we have. 
Then moving into the, the studying and writing workshops, we have ones for polishing assignments, tips for getting started. That's always um, the, the hardest part sometimes in the assignment is that getting started and structuring it. Ones for um, English language, math, strategies when you're taking multiple choice exams. So there's really um, a wide selection that will give you tangible skills in that subject area. And when you've attended five of the workshops, you can receive a co-curricular record on your transcripts. So that's always um, great too, that you can go on and tell your future employer that you've really learned these skills and then demonstrate it um, from the workshops. You can book all of the workshops and register for them from um, FanshawLibrary.com. And they're of course free. So you can attend as many as you like, but the great option is, is after you've attended five, you do get that um, additional co-curricular transcript, record on your transcript. So we encourage you to stay connected to us on social media. Um, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and the handle is at Fanshawe Library. You, of course, can follow um, at Fanshawe Here For You on Instagram, and that would include all of Fanshawe student services. So not only the Library Learning Commons, but also um, Counseling and Accessibility, the Wellness Center, et cetera. Uh, on our social media, you'll find a lot of fun videos highlighting our staff and our services, useful study tips, any notices about technical interruptions. And we also have a lot of daily prize giveaways. So that's an, um, always a, an added bonus for students. Um, yeah, so we hope you stay connected and keep up to date with all the different events and news um, that's happening in the Library Learning Commons. I'm now going to pass our presentation over to my colleague, Megan Shannon, who's the Academic Integrity Manager at the college, and she'll be able to explain more to you about academic integrity. Thanks so much, Nicole. So good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for attending today's wor uh, workshop or information session. Um, my name is Megan Shannon. I'm the Manager of Academic Integrity at Fanshawe. And I wanted to provide you with some information about why academic integrity is important, the initiatives that are going on at Fanshawe, and all of the information, the services, the resources, and the supports that are available to our students so that they can achieve and maintain academic integrity as they progress through their programs and so that they can avoid any academic offenses as well. So Fanshawe is defining academic integrity as being accountable for performing academic work both honestly and ethically. So this is certainly something that faculty and staff expect of each other. It's definitely something that we expect of our students and ultimately those actions and behaviors that inform integrity in general and integrity in the academic setting, which is academic integrity, is what employers and recruiters will be expecting of our graduates. So I hope what students will be able to see is that integrity in general and academic integrity will transition with them. It will evolve and develop um, and will become professional integrity, which they can demonstrate when they're out in the workplace, out in the community. So let's get into the presentation. So I think Alex has my slides. Perfect. Thank you. So as far as why academic integrity is important, these three bullet points are coming directly from our academic integrity policy. So it works from the top down as well as the bottom up. I hope you'll be able to see that it really is a sustainability model of sorts that we're looking at. So academic integrity is important because it ensures fairness in the education that's pursued, in the academic work that's completed, and in the grades that are earned. This may seem very obvious, but there's a lot to unpack here. So I'll just take it apart a little bit. So as far as fairness in education pursued, we are certainly looking to ensure and instill fairness in the educational setting between and across students. So the example that comes up very often is if we have student A and student B, if student A were to invest the time and the effort to do their own work, they will have earned a grade that reflects the their understanding of course content and will reflect the fact that they're developing um, a mastery of the skills that they'll need to go through the program and get out into the workplace. If we have student B who did not invest the time, did not invest the effort, and was somehow able to obtain a similar, higher, lower, or comparable grade, it wouldn't be fair to student A, nor would it be fair to other students in the class. So we're really looking for fairness across our students. 
We're also looking for fairness between students and faculty. It takes a lot of time for faculty to investigate academic offenses, and time, as, I sure you're no, as I'm sure you know, is a finite thing. Um, so that time that, it, that the academic offenses require um, may result in less time to course prep, uh, lesson prep, um, communicating students, et cetera. So we're really looking for fairness for everyone involved in the college community. Academic work being completed, again, may sound very obvious, but there's certainly a difference between submitting work and students actually completing work. So for students to receive and earn their grades, um, they need to prepare, complete, and submit work that is their own, work that reflects their own understanding of the course content. Um, and grades being earned, again, uh, this may seem obvious as well, but there's again is certainly a difference between obtaining grades and earning grades. So I get a lot of questions from students about tuition. Um, they'll tell me that they paid X amount of tuition and they're expecting return on, on their investment and certainly they should be. Um, but the tuition entitles students to access to their courses and course sites and um, the course materials to faculty who are experts in their field and to all of the services and resources that are available to them at the college. The tuition doesn't mean that grades are purchased. Um, they're not bought. The grades are earned based on the academic work that's completed and hopefully that's happening in an educational setting that is fair. So if we can accomplish the first bullet point, we can then accomplish the second, which would be protecting the value of the credentials that we confer upon our graduates. So those degrees, those diplomas, and those certificates. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, if we take those two students, student A and student B, if student A completed their work and earned their grade, grades, they will have then earned their diploma, and they'll be able to get out into the workplace and meet the expectations of their employer. If student B perhaps cheated on a test, didn't submit work that was their own, somehow obtained grades and was somehow able to obtain a diploma, they may also get out into the workplace, but they would not be able to meet the expectations of their employer. So at that point, we have a discrepancy uh, with regards to how those credentials are valued. So it's for the benefit and the advantage of our current students, our recent graduates, um, all of the staff and the faculty at the college working to get students through programs that we protect the value of those degrees. And it's really important to our communities, to our local, national and global communities that we protect um, the value of those credentials because they're depending on our graduates out in the workplace and out in the community. So overall, what we're really trying to do is reinforce Fanshawe's reputation for our students' perspective, current and recent, um, for our faculty and staff and for uh, the community that we support. So that's why academic integrity is important. That is what's really powering um, all of our initiatives. So if we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So we do have an academic integrity policy. It's policy A136, which is within the college's policy manual. It's available online. It is a public facing document, so anyone can access it. And that policy is essentially doing three things, another three bullet points for you. So it's identifying the actions and behaviors that the college considers to be an academic offense. We are defining an academic offense as obtaining or attempting to obtain an unfair advantage for credit um, our academic work by dishonest means. So the key concepts to keep in mind there are the attempt to gain an unfair advantage and dishonest means. I think if you keep those in mind, you'll start to see why certain things are considered offenses. So the policy is then describing and in some cases prescribing the penalties that will apply should those academic offenses occur. And the bulk of that document is detailing the administrative process so everything that happens, all of the steps and the sequence of events from the time an offense is suspected, an investigation occurs, um, a discussion is had with the student, and from then the offense is either confirmed or it's not. If the offense is not confirmed, then the process stops there. But if the offense is confirmed, then we proceed with the process. The student is notified, a form is completed, and the form comes to my office and the registrar's office for processing. Um, the administrative process involves a lot of work on behalf of the faculty, but it's really important for students to know 
what that process is, how that process works, should they ever find themselves involved in it um, for purposes of procedural fairness. So if students ever have any questions about the application or interpretation of the policy, they're more than welcome to contact uh, me directly and I can walk them through the steps and we can make sure that procedural fairness is happening. So if we go to the next slide from there. Perfect. So these are the 11 offenses that are detailed in the policy. Um, they're not necessarily organized in any particular order, but it does just so happen that the first offense listed, which is plagiarism, is the offense that we see most often. So plagiarism has four categories, but the main two that we see happening every once in a while are students submitting work that is not their own and either failing to or neglecting to cite or improper citation. And sometimes those two go in hand in hand. So students, again, need to prepare, complete, and submit work that is their own. Um, they should avoid sites like Coursera where they can download potentially previously submitted assignments. Um, we do see some students accessing those and replacing the names with their own. Um, there's no guarantee that those course content sharing sites like Coursera contained um, assignments that are that have been completed properly, that they meet, have met the requirements of the current assignment, or that they received decent or good grades. So there is a lot of risk associated with that. We do so see some students sharing work with other students, um, and we see a lot of students copying and pasting content that they find online and submitting it as their own. They can certainly include online content in their assignments, but that's where the citing comes into play. So as Alex and Nicole mentioned, there are so many supports and resources and services available to students to help with citation. And that allows students to incorporate the research that they've done into their assignments, but the citing allows them to differentiate what is their own thoughts and their own words from what is someone else's thoughts in that other person's words that supports their work. Um, so citing again is very important and there are many resources available to help with that. Um, a couple others that I'll touch on, acting to assist and facilitate an offense is considered an academic offense. So this could be the person who shared work with another person who ended up submitting it as their own. Um, this could be uh, participating in social media applications and sharing test related content while a test is in progress. Um, number six is participating in certain activities that might be considered an academic offense. This usually happens when we have one or four of the one or more of these 11 offenses happening in any one instance. Seven and eight we are seeing some of currently um, students using materials, resources, or technologies that shouldn't be used what, um, in preparing an assignment. So things like consulting websites that they shouldn't. Um, accessing the databases and services through the, re the library is a good way to avoid that one. Making use of certain technologies such as spin bots or word generators, um, that tends to compromise the integrity of the student's work because we have a tool writing for the student, not the student writing for the student. And then number eight is someone similar being in possession of or using materials, resources, or technologies while a quiz test or exam is in progress. So this could be referring to course notes or course materials or textbooks when a test is not open book. It could be Googling answers, um, co collaborating or communicating with other students, um, or making use of secondary devices such as a secondary a laptop, um, a phone, a tablet. We have seen some issues come up with the Apple watches as well. So um, anything that could compromise the integrity of someone's test and render it ineligible for marks are situations that we want to avoid and we want our students to be able to avoid. So those are the 11 offenses. Um, if students ever have any concerns about how to avoid them, if they find themselves um, being identified as participating in them, um, I'm certainly available, <clears throat> I'm certainly available to students um, to get them through the process and get them on track so that these offenses can be avoided. So that's just a bit of an overview of our offenses from the policy. And if we could go to the next slide. Perfect. So here we have the warnings and penalties that will apply should those offenses occur. So those 11 offenses are listed on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, we have our warning and penalty options. So some offenses start with a warning. We're really trying to apply 
our policy through, or we're looking at it through two different lenses. On the one hand, we're trying to provide students with learning opportunities so that they can correct and remedy certain actions and behaviors. That's why we have warnings in place. Warnings are not penalties. On the other hand, though, we are looking at our policy through the lens of applying disciplinary measures when necessary, um, when they have to be applied. So that would be applying a penalty. So some offenses for a first occurrence will start with a warning, um, such as for plagiarism, um, especially for citing. The student may get a warning saying they haven't cited at all or properly. The warning is to connect with services, resources, and supports that can help them and make those improvements before their next assignment is due. And then other penalty or other offenses start with penalties, such as a mark of zero, which could be applied to um, a portion of a rubric, compromised portions of an assignment or test, or to an assignment or test in its entirety. And then as offenses continue to occur, or if more severe offenses occur, then the penalties will escalate and can include failure of a course, suspension, or expulsion. Um, which don't happen very often, um, and there's certainly things we want to avoid. Um, so usually we're seeing students between um, warnings and marks of zero, that kind of thing. But just, I don't want to scare anyone, but my intention in showing the slide is to be transparent, but also let students know that there are certain risks um, or consequences that are associated when risks are taken. And I have a number of tips coming up um, to help students avoid any offenses. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Perfect. So those supports and resources are um, a number of um, supports, um, resources, services, um, consultations, etc., that are available through the Academic Integrity Office as well as through the Library and Learning Commons. So as Nicole and um, Alex mentioned, we offer a, a whole suite of workshops that are available to students. They're usually about an hour in length. If you attend five, you can get a CCR credit on your transcript. We are available for one-on-one -on -one consultations, whether that's via email exchange, over Zoom, over the phone. Um, I am booking one-on-one -on -one appointments with students in person. Um, it does have to be done in, in advance for now. My office is located within the library learning commons. So hopefully soon we'll be able to do drop-in meetings and that kind of thing. But Zoom and the phone and email um, allows us to um, react and move pretty quickly and not have to wait for an appointment. So consultations are still available. They're just available in a bit of a hybrid model right now. And referrals. Um, I refer a lot of students to all of the services available through the Library Learning Commons and throughout the rest of the college. Um, if maybe they need to check certain documents at the registrar's office, uh, maybe they need to talk to someone in the international office, um, maybe someone in accessibility or counseling can help them out. Um, so lots of referrals are available. We want to make sure the student gets to the services and supports that they need. And within the library, again, we offer research, writing, citing, math and science help, um, as well as study strategies and skills as well. So there is a lot available to you and we are committed to the success of our students. So if we go to the next slide, please. Perfect. So just some tips for assignments, some things to keep in mind. Read your assignment instructions carefully. And if you have any questions, go directly to your course instructor. They are the academic authority for your course. They have to answer your questions and they will provide you with answers that are accurate. We do see some students who rely on the false assumptions of friends or other students, and that could put them in a risky situation. If students have questions, the course instructor is the right person to go with, and they will get you the answer that you need. Understand what assignments are to be completed individually and when it's okay to work as a group. Right now online, because we don't have students, as so many students, face-to-face -face in traditional in-person classrooms, we really are encouraging students to collaborate and work together to understand course content. But a line has to be drawn between discussions about course content and actual assignments. Those assignments are the student's opportunity to demonstrate their own understanding of course content and to demonstrate that they're developing a mastery of the skills they need to move through the program and to get out into the workplace. So some assignments do include group work. Some assignments are to be completed individually, and if they're individual assignments, the work has to reflect only that individual student's work. 
understand which tools and resources are permitted for use and when it's okay to use them, and avoid certain tools and resources that are not permitted. Um, if you have any questions about those, again, go to your course instructor. They'll let you know if something can be used and how, um, if those can be used how you can meet the requirements of your assignment by using them and something just the last point something i've been noticing since working remotely for about a year now um, the days can tend to blur together and some meetings and things tend to creep up so if students are able to keep track of their due dates and plan ahead they'll be able to avoid certain situations where they may be at risk of taking certain risks that could put them at risk of academic offenses so if they need an extension, they have a legitimate reason for an extension, always go directly to your course instructor and they'll work with you to make the arrangements that you need. And then next slide. Perfect, so just some tips for evaluations. So those quizzes, those tests and those exams, please keep in mind that talking to, communicating with and collaborating with other students are not permitted while a quiz test or exam is in progress. Again, that test is your own opportunity to demonstrate your own understanding of the course content. Talking to someone else, whether it's through a chat, um, whether they're in the room with you, um, whether it's social media, however, um, it could compromise your test as well as theirs. So make sure your room or wherever you're writing the test, you're free from distraction. Any electronic devices are out of reach and not in use, and you can focus on your test for your own marks. Again, understand the materials, resources, and technologies and tools that are permitted for use or prohibited from use while an evaluation is in progress. The use of cell phones or other electronic devices, like I've just mentioned, are not permitted. The only device that should be in use is the device on which the test is being written. Some tests require students to use calculators, so make sure you have an actual calculator at hand and you're not using the app on your phone. And then lastly, accommodations for accessibility. Some students require having someone in the room with them, or they may require a certain device or the use of a certain resource. I don't wanna see students with accessibility accommodations getting offenses when they don't need to. So if you have accessibility accommodations, if you've worked with um, our counseling and accessibility department, make sure your course instructor understands what you need and how you need to proceed in order to complete a test. They will work with you to make the arrangements that you need. It just involves a conversation. So those are just some tips. And then um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so this is me. So along with my colleagues, um, Nicole and Alex, I'm more than happy to answer any questions, address any concerns. Um, Co yeah, collaborate or just have any discussions that students need to have. So that is my email address. Please know that you are more than welcome to email anytime should you have any questions or concerns. And that it, that's it for my part. So I, I wish you all the very best um, in whatever you're currently doing and in the studies that you decide to proceed with. So thank you for your time. All right, thank you all. That was a wonderful overview on your student service at Fanshawe College. Um, so we will now move on to the live Q&A. And I'd just like to remind our audience that if you want to ask a question, please submit it with the questions feature. To open the questions feature, click on the speech bubble with a question mark. We have a number of questions in the queue already and we'll try our best to get through all of your submitted questions within the session's time. If you have any questions after the session, we recommend you email myfuture at fanshawc.ca or book an appointment with one of our Fanshawe College recruiters. Um, so let's go ahead and start with our first question. Are library resources accessible from home? I can take this one. I can take that one. Okay. <laughs> go, go ahead. ahead. I'll, wait. I'll go ahead. So, um, yeah, the, actually, the majority of our, our collection is accessible from home. Like I was saying um, at the start, we, we moved a lot of our content online um, to try and serve our, our students at satellite campuses first. And then with the renovation, we just continued that that forward motion um, moved, I would say, like almost 90 percent of our collection um, online. And the beauty of that is that you can access it from home. Um, anytime, anywhere, it's available 24-7 to students. So all they need is their Fanshawe username and password to access all of the library resources uh, at any time. 
Awesome, thank you for that. Um, our next question is, is the library open? I'm pretty sure yeah, you already so, know that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go ahead, we can take turns. <laughs> um, so the Library Learning Commons is open. Currently, if you would like to come in and borrow a book from the physical collection or use it as study space, it is open from 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. Um, and like Alex said, you can of course access all of the electronic resources and services um, from anywhere, anytime with your uh, Fanshawe username and password. And you can of course use the Ask, ask On feature um, available from the library's website and that's available like Alex said, from 6 a.m. till midnight, Monday to Friday, and then 11 a.m. till 5 p.m. on the weekends. So there's a, a long um, range of hours of availability. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, our next question from the audience is, um, I am a current undergrad at University of Western and wanted to know if the library at Fanshawe would have overlap with the resources available at the University of Western Library. That's a really good question. Um, so we do have a couple of programs that um, that are in, in collaboration in conjunction with Western. Um, so if you are in, in nursing or business, we um, we have an agreement with Western libraries that we can um, access some of, of their resources. Um, if you're not, there are some you know more common library databases that probably most post-secondary institutions across the the province um, have access to. So within the databases um like i was saying briefly earlier there are some databases that are pretty um subject specific and, and those might vary depending on what school you're at and what programs are are offered at your institution but there are other databases um uh, academic search ultimate is is an example where it's a really big broad database and probably again most post-secondary institutions would have access to those kind of standard generalized databases because they are really good starting points for your research um, so for sure there's definitely going to be um, some overlap probably mostly coincidentally but uh, we do have some um, some back and forth with western libraries because we have programs um, that are, are joint between us and and between western yeah great um, another question is, um, what is your self-plagiarism policy? Self-plagiarism. So we do, we have a lot of students and faculty who will refer to self-plagiarism as um, double submission. So it is possible for students to plagiarize themselves. So if students have, you know, if we have a student who is going through the marketing program, for example, and in level three, or if they're currently in level three and they have to write a paper on social media marketing and they recall that they wrote something similar in level one, um, it would be best for them. We always encourage the student to have a conversation with their course instructor. They find out whether that paper can be used for the basis of the new one. Um, the course instructor will let them know if that's okay and how to still meet the requirements of the current assignment by using that previous assignment. To just resubmit it, to submit something that's been marked, whether it's already received marked at Fanshawe or another institution, would be considered double submission. So that would be an attempt to gain an unfair advantage. It would be fair to the other students in the class investing the time or effort to get that assignment done. So we do recognize double submission and we do work with students and our faculty to make sure we get customized um, assignments and um, instructions and requirements to students who want to use their previous work as the basis of current work. So it's something we do recognize, but we try to work with students to get them through it. I hope that helps. Thanks, Megan. No, that was a great answer for that question, actually. Um, all right, so our next question is, how can I connect with a library staff member virtually? Uh -huh. um, I can take that. So you can definitely um, book appointments um, with everyone that I mentioned from the library's website. So from uh, FanshawLibrary.com on the right side, um, you'll be able to um, connect with us virtually. And then you can just select, for example, Alex and I have a website and Sam and Jerry and Cheryl. So you'll be able to um, email any of us and book an appointment from the library's website. And then generally we have the um, appointments virtually over Zoom. We're also available to do telephone appointments. That's 
perfect. All right, so our next question is, how can I learn more about using the library resources? So that's a, a big question. Um, first of all, if you, um, are curious you know about your specific assignment you can always email the address that's on the screen here the llc at fanshawc.ca that's a really good just general starting point if you're not sure who to reach out to um, so if you email our general inbox we'll make sure it gets directed um, to the correct person who can give you more information um, if you, you know, have a better idea of what you might be looking for that's where the appointments would come in for sure so like i was saying earlier um, Nicole and I meet with students. Um, we can start, you know, right at the very beginning with you. Um, and, and our goal is to teach students the skills that they need to succeed. You know, we're not here to, to do the work for students, but to, to work with you, teach you those skills so that hopefully in the future you feel a bit more confident about using library resources and, you know, all of the, um, the ins and outs of the research process and, and citation and everything like that. So the appointments are good if you have a specific question or a specific assignment that you're struggling with but more generally um if you're just looking you know for a, an overview of of library resources that's where the workshops are probably going to be your best bet um so if you recall kind of back in the middle of the presentation nicole had a slide um with a, a snapshot of our, our workshop offering so there's lots available um, again they cover a wide variety of topics so right from the beginning there's research foundations um, it talks about how to, to navigate the library databases. If you're past that part and you want to talk more about writing, we have writing and punctuation workshops as well. Um, and then at the kind of the end of the process, that's where the academic integrity and APA citation workshops would come in too. So again, lots of, of resources to learn about um, library content. Uh, again, use the, the email address there if you're not sure who to reach out to. If you have a specific question, ask me or Nicole. Um, but if you just want to get a, a nice overview of, of what uh, what our services involve, that's where I would recommend the workshops. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Alexandra. Um, so then our last question for today would be, where can I go specifically for research and assignment help? Um, I can take that. So for research help, I would definitely encourage you to reach out to Alex and myself. Um, we can have a one-on-one -on -one appointment and look specifically at what your research needs are and the best strategies to um, access the, the sources that you need. We can walk you through that and explain the process and then you'll be able to continue on and, and use those skills and strategies that we show you. Um, the next question was about assignment help. So um, if you're interested in learning um, about assignments as far as writing, the assignment and structuring written assignments, then I would um, certainly recommend um, Samantha Diamond, who you can also um, book an appointment with from the fanchalibrary.com um, under English and ESL um, on the right side there that you'll be able to reach out to Sam there and she'll be able to um, give you strategies um, to help you improve your written assignments. Perfect, thank you so much, Nicole. So with that said, we have now reached the end of our session. Um, thank you to all the students who submitted questions today. Um, we hope that we answered all of your questions in regards to academic supports, assignments, research, and testing. If you think of any more questions today, please connect um, with our info kiosk or international live chat who can help you make the most out of your virtual open house experience. And I would really like to thank our speakers for all of your time today um, and to take your time to just, you know, give us a good overview about the services at Fanshawe College. Um, so thank you so much. And I hope everyone else enjoys the rest of your day and the virtual open house. Okay. Good luck, everyone. Thanks so much.